Hello everyone, welcome to another MRCB Paces video. Today we are going to be doing cardiology cases, okay, and the top tips. So this one is not going to be on the examination specifically because I've already covered examination uh, and specifically presenting valves, which I'm going to be linking up here and you can check it out here um, in conjunction with this video, okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Vishal Kumar. I am a doctor in the UK. I have finished MRCP and I've set up this YouTube channel so that you can learn from everything that I have learned and also my website, keenmedic.com. So do check it out. So let's get started. So what am I going to be covering in this specific video so this is going to be the structure of the video it's going to be a little bit long so make sure you are comfortable and have a drink in hand okay and have a pen and paper i would advise if you like to take notes so i'm going to start off with the scenario and then we are going to move on to um the adverse features that you need to look out for and we'll cover three different uh, specific conditions that can present in paces okay so chest pain palpitation and loss of consciousness and finally we'll finish off with the answer to the scenario that we started off with all right so let's get going the format that i'm going to be taking is that i'm going to be covering only the most important points in the history the exam the investigations and also the management plan i will not be covering the basics because you can do this yourself okay so the basics would be um, all the usual stuff that you would do as doctors you will know all of this already i'm not going to be covering any of that um, as I said before, only the important stuff that you may miss. All right, so the scenario I was talking about is this. So do feel free to pause and read this. You are asked to take a history from and examine a 33-year-old uh, young woman with palpitations okay so that's the scenario so think about the history and exam the differentials the investigations and the management plan and now pause the video and with your pen and paper write down your approach for this scenario in this order okay write down all the things you're going to do and say and uh, perform all right so write down each step because later down the line we're going to see what you um, have written down and whether or not some of it matches up with what i would suggest all right pause it and do that now Let's talk about the adverse features then. So these adverse features are a set of um, factors that you need to be looking out in every single cardiovascular um, presentation, okay? So this is specific for history and also in uh, station five, which are short clinical consultations. And the scenario is like a station five scenario, right? So. For those of you who are who are not very familiar with the UK system, I would highly advise that you look up and get familiarized with the Resuscitation Council's guidelines in the UK for tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias, bradycardias, okay? In those, they also go through the adverse features. So these are chest pain, heart failure, syncope, and hemodynamic instability. So these four are the four pillars of adverse features that you need to look out for and make sure are not present in every single cardiovascular presentation. So the first scenario is of chest pain, which is probably the most common thing that you will see in real life in your day-to-day -day job as doctors, okay? So with chest pain, I'm again not going to cover all the specific things, so let's talk about the history specifically. So you need to obviously look out for things like the character, whether it's crushing, heavy or tearing, amongst others, the radiation to the arms next so these two things specifically will be for acute coronary syndromes right so that's the reason why tearing is more specifically for uh, aortic dissection uh, exacerbating whether or not it is worse with exertion again for acute coronary syndrome and adverse features that we highlighted earlier on 
the cardiovascular risk factors for acute coronary syndromes, all of this, which you will all be familiar with, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and family history. By family history, it, if, their, if their parents, for example, okay, had acute coronary syndrome or died of some kind of heart attack at the age of 75 or 80, then that is not really relevant. Okay? However, if they died at the age of 45 or 50, that is relevant because that is a much younger age. So that is a relevant family history um, in, in the sense that you know, that is a positive family history. Okay, so what is considered positive is usually the age of less than 55 if they have um, got a first degree relative who passed away with um, acute coronary syndrome. All right, and of course, the onset and associated symptoms. So I'm just going to highlight some specific points here. A lot of this covers acute coronary syndrome. Tearing is for aortic dissection, adverse features, as I said earlier, for every single cardiovascular history. Onset, so if they have a sudden onset of chest pain, this can be a number of things. So it can be acute coronary syndrome, right? It can also be pulmonary embolism. It can be pneumothorax, or it can be something more drastic like aortic dissection or esophageal rupture. These are the... Um, these are the co conditions that are most serious with an acute onset okay and those are the things that you need to be uh, definitely ruling out associated symptoms so if they have got chest pain again earlier on so you need to think about things like shortness of breath with pulmonary embolism hemoptysis with pulmonary embolism okay um, and these are the things that you need to be asking um, for for a fact in addition to all of the above all right Okay, let's move on. You, you would just look at them, okay? They will obviously be in pain. They will be flushed. And if they've got some kind of respiratory issues, then they will have accessory muscle suits. You need to always look out for the pulse with the rate, rhythm, and character. And uh, auscultate and think about whether or not you might need to do maneuvers. If you can hear some kind of uh, murmur, then do uh, perform the, all the maneuvers. If you don't, then it is not absolutely necessary for you to perform all the maneuvers because it is not necessarily relevant, okay? But we are talking about a Station 5 scenario here, okay? So in Station 5, you already have a number of things to do. So you may or may not have enough time to perform all the maneuvers. If it is relevant, always perform them. Do look out for the fluid status because that will tell you whether or not they have got a heart failure, which may be acute or chronic. It is relevant either way. Blood pressure measurement is important for the case of aortic dissection. So you would do that on both sides. And if there is a discrepancy, which is significant, then you would think about whether or not the patient might need CT aortogram, okay, which we will come on to next in the investigations bit. So here we go. Investigations and management. Now... With every single investigation and management where there is a chance the patient may be acutely unwell, always make sure that you say this. It is a key phrase, okay, and it is very important in one's assessment, and that is A to E assessment, okay? Always make sure you say this. Now, uh, in your exam, if you mention this, this is fine. They won't, they won't always ask you to say what are the elements of A to E because they also know what that is, okay? but you will need to specify certain aspects of them. So in terms of management for chest pain, the single most relevant and immediate investigation you need is of course the ECG, okay? If they are having an ST elevation myocardial infarction, otherwise known as an STEMI, they need to have primary PCI immediately, okay? After that, you would of, of course also need stuff like the their blood test with their troponin and maybe D-dimer based on what, what your suspicion of a pulmonary embolism, okay, is. So then you would use something called a well score. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, do look it up with um, with a simple Google search. Be mindful though, because well score can be used for um, deep vein thrombosis, DVT, or pulmonary embolism. So there are two of them. So look look it up for uh, pulmonary pulmonary embolism. 
all right and venous blood gas and chest x-ray is important for ruling out things like pneumothorax or infections which can be really uh, severe in which case they can give chest pain as well and further imaging to be considered are uh, CT pulmonary angiogram, CTPA, or CT eotogram. Okay, CTPA would be to look for evidence of pulmonary embolism, or CT eotogram for aortic dissection. All of these are the immediate acute concerns that you need to look out for. All right, so these are the very um, important things that you need to be saying in your um, in your question and answer with your examiner. What is underestimated is the patient themselves, okay, and their need. And don't do that. You need to always think what they've presented with, which is theirs, which is the most important thing here. Of course, you're going to be doing all this as their doctor, right? This is your agenda, okay? This is your agenda, but this is the patient's agenda. They are in pain, so you need to alleviate them of their pain, okay? So make sure you give them analgesia and that it is adequate as well, okay? This may be GTN, this may be morphine, whatever, okay? Just make sure they have got something and that it is effective. And lastly, but definitely not the least, in terms of the management, you would also think about uh, considering ACS, acute coronary syndrome, the, the protocol, okay, the entire bundle, or treatment dose, low molecular weight heparin, depending on what you are thinking about. Just be mindful, if you are thinking about something like a aortic dissection, giving them ACS protocol or low molecular weight heparin won't be ideal, okay? So it all depends on their clinical presentation and their examination findings, um, ECG findings, all of that. So just be careful about what you say depending on what the presentation is, all right? So let's move on to the next condition. Palpitations. So this is the scenario that we looked at at the very start. So with palpitations, I find that uh, in most cases, now I'm not going to say all because palpitations can be really serious as well, but in most cases, this is not a medical emergency because usually it's it's just stuff like atrial fibrillation, uh, atrial flutter with no hemodynamic compromise, thyrotoxicity, which again is not um, severe, or often it's just anxiety. So I find it's not the most acute of presentations. However, it is very, very common, which is why it is here. So history as earlier on. So we need to be thinking about onset, frequency and duration. This is relevant because if it, they are having the palpitations every single day, as opposed to once every few months, then your investigation is going to vary, okay? And we'll talk about that in a minute. Next is the exacerbating and relieving factors. So you need to find out whether or not, uh, what kind of situations they are in when these palpitations come on, whether they are at rest, whether they are moving around, whether they are in stressful situations, okay? Uh, all of this is relevant, whether they, whether they have had caffeine recently before they have these palpitations episodes, all right? Um, and any history of arrhythmias or thyroid disease. So thyroid is extremely relevant here for palpitations. They may be thyrotoxic, so that is very important here for you to understand and always, always check in palpitation scenario. Okay. Um, in terms of arrhythmias, some of some patients may well have evidence, uh, may well have histories of supraventricular tachycardias or SVTs. Okay, even as children, and they may have had some kind of ablation therapy, and they may have just had a recurrence of that. So that's important for that reason. Adverse features, as earlier on. Cardiovascular risk factors, again, as earlier on, because there are some patients may have um, ischemic heart disease, which may be causing the palpitations. In addition to all the uh, adverse features, you would also check things like shortness of breath, because what can happen is that sometimes patients with uh, atrial fibrillation, for example, can complain of feeling short of breath. Now, this is something uh, which you might think that it is a bit odd because how would atrial fibrillation cause shortness of breath? But sometimes what can happen is that they may well um, 
interpret the palpitations at feeling out of breath okay so this does happen uh, or they may have an infection underlying which a chest infection which may be causing the onset of the uh, tachyarrhythmia all right so let's talk about the examination so there are few things to do for palpitations and these are again you need to just look at their general appearance as before look at the pulse very important in this case the rate rhythm and character auscultation as earlier with or without maneuvers and fluid status again to look at evidence of acute heart failure if they've got acute heart failure in the context of palpitations then that is basically um, an emergency systolic function is likely to be compromised so you need to act swiftly and lastly, but definitely not the least, the thing that is often missed out is the thyroid status. Okay, you need to uh, do a full thyroid status examination. I will cover thyroid status uh, in a different video, so do look out for that. Uh, but it involves everything from looking at the hands, goiter, soloing, uh, sweating, everything. Okay, so all of that. I'm just going to give a tip for station five itself because you are going to be running out of time in station five for palpitations okay so uh, what you can do is you can do all of this so all the top four things within about if you think about it within a two minute uh, span of time frame and also incorporate thyroid status examination in another further two minutes or so so that is about four minutes which is easily doable if you think about it in a palpitation scenario you do have to examine thyroid status guys you can't just skip it in a station five scenario okay you won't score the marks otherwise okay so let's talk about the investigations and management as before a to e assessment okay so if you if you said this and remembered this well done to you and next palpitations again what's the single most important thing the ecg okay that will tell you how acute it is and whether or not something is going on right now the other thing which i haven't probably mentioned in this slide is the cardiac monitor especially if the ecg is abnormal okay remember i also earlier on talked about the uh, frequency of palpitations so if their frequency is daily as opposed to say once a week you would need two different types of investigations it's quite easy really so if it's daily you just do a 24-hour tape okay so based on their symptoms if it is say once a week or twice a week or three times a week then just do the seven day tape because that will then pick up okay most likely pick up what's going on there so that's why the frequency is very important for you to consider Next thing is, of course, the causes of um, palpitations. You would do things like the full blood count because, you know, if they're anemic, they may well be having palpitations because of that. All the electrolytes, including, you know, all the urine electrolytes for renal function, plus calcium, magnesium, all of that. And if you are suspecting, based on your uh, history and examination, um, a significant thyroid issue, then you should also go ahead and do the thyroid function plus or minus the autoantibodies. Think about infections and to rule it out, you would do a chest x-ray with the uh, normal film and safety net if you are discharging them remember what i said earlier on so palpitations may or may not be acute um, or severe so if you are thinking that you know they can go home with like a 24-hour tape or a seven day tape if their ecg is normal and if there's no hemodynamic compromise from your a to e assessment then you may be thinking about discharging them in which case you need to always safety net okay so what is safety netting? You need to ask them to come back to hospital if they have any of the adverse features, okay, or if their symptoms don't resolve um, in the next few days, okay, because they may well need further monitoring. They may need a cardiac monitor. They may well need a 24-hour tape or seven-day day as an inpatient, okay, so they may need further investigation. So always safety net, guys, okay.
Lastly, but definitely not the least, guys, is loss of consciousness or syncope. This is the one thing that a lot of people do fear. So I want to take a moment to just go through this uh, to cover the things that you definitely need to do. OK, so again, as we did earlier on, let's start off with the history. So with the history, you need to think about the setting when they are having these episodes of syncope. It may well be an isolated episode or it may be recurrent. You need to always ask what they are doing and where they are when they are doing that activity um, in terms of the syncope. Okay, so they may well be lying in bed or a lot of the time they may well be doing uh, some form of activity when they are sitting up or standing up uh, or walking. Okay. Or they may be doing absolutely nothing. They may be watching a film in their couch. Uh, so it's just very important. The setting is vital. Whether or not uh, they have got any symptoms pre-syncope, you need to always ask for things like chest pain, palpitations, headache, visual disturbances, weakness uh, in any part of the body, any kind of aura is also important, okay? So just because we are covering this scenario in a cardiovascular examination, doesn't mean you, you can forget the other bits. There is a very large proportion of patients with syncope who have a neurological component to the etiology. Okay, so epilepsy, any kinds of stroke um, are also important. Whether or not it is witnessed is vital for obvious reasons. So when someone suffers from syncope, they obviously don't always know what has happened. Uh, so if, for example, they are having recurrent episodes, you need to ask them whether or not someone has seen them have these episodes, okay? So most of the times they will have some kind of witness. What you need to ask is what their witnesses say uh, happens when they have these syncopes. So this is just before, during and after, okay? So you need to ask for things like how they act and uh, how long they are passed out for, okay? And whether or not they have any tonic-clonic activity, any jerking movements, whether they have any incontinence and tongue biting. And when they do come around, uh, however long that might be after, whether or not they become alert quite soon after, within a minute or so, or whether they take half an hour, an hour, or even several hours to come around, or whether they're confused, whether they have any weakness in any parts of their body when they come around, okay, which then results. These are all very important questions. So witness is very important. Next is the duration, which often the witness will be able to give you. Post syncope, as earlier as I mentioned, how frequently they are having this these episodes. Whether this is an isolated episode versus if they are having this daily, weekly, yearly, you need to find out because, it, again, your investigations will depend on the frequency as per the palpitations. Adverse features, as always, guys. Now let's talk about the examination. So there are a few things that you will need to do in the examinations. So I have generalized it into cardiovascular and neuro because really in the, uh, let's say, a &E setting or your acute medical unit where you will be admitting the patient, you should be doing everything, okay, in these two major um, parts of the system. However, for the sake of station five the station in the station five scenario you need to be uh, really honing down on the history and depending on the history you need to be examining them okay so let's say they are a 76 year old man and uh, they are having syn recurring syncope episodes when they are out in the garden or maybe they are in the shop or they are out having lunch with their friends and they complain that they have some kind of dizziness or faintness before the episode happens but then after they have the episode uh, they and somebody lies them on the ground or they fall fall on the ground after about a minute or so they they come around and the witnesses um, say that there is no evidence of any kind of seizure activity or incontinence and that two minutes later after the episode they are fully conscious and alert and talking and they know exactly what's happening. 
So in this kind of scenario, this is suggestive of something uh, postural, isn't it? This is probably something along the lines of postural hypotension, which may be due to their medications. So you would need to do stuff like medication review, or they may have some kind of some kind of underlying physiological condition like a diabetic neuropathy, for example. So in this sort of situation, your focus mainly would be on the cardiovascular side of things rather than the neurology, okay? So in station five, you would do a more cardiovascular focused examination as opposed to neurology. That doesn't mean you will ignore neurology. You should still do a gross neurological examination, checking that they are able to move all their limbs, their power is okay, um, and also there is no gross cranial nerve abnormalities, there's no facial asymmetry, things like that, okay? So I hope that makes sense, guys. So you should use your history to guide you to perform a focused examination of the relevant system in station five, depending on what you find in the history, okay? Uh, in this presentation of loss of consciousness. So let's now talk about the initial uh, management of the uh, patient, A to E assessment, okay? Always do this, always say this, it should always be on your tongue in the station five scenario, in every single acute situation. We are, we are thinking about cardiovascular causes, so ECG is very important. 24-hour tape or seven-day tape as earlier on because arrhythmias can cause syncope. And lying standing blood pressure to rule out postural hypotension. Now this, you would consider doing it up to three times, okay, at different times and with the patient standing for two minutes because that will give you a more realistic idea of whether or not they have got a postural drop. And blood tests with troponin and D-dimers. Now, if they've got an acute coronary syndrome type event, and um, then that can cause syncope or collapse. Or if they've got a large pulmonary embolism, then uh, that would also cause a collapse, which is why you need to think about doing a D-dimer. However, having said that, if they have got a pulmonary embolism, which is large enough to cause collapse, then they are not likely to be well enough for you to be, you know, faffing around with D-dimers, honestly. So if they if they have come in with a collapse and you have a high suspicion of a pulmonary embolism, then you wouldn't even think about doing D-dimers because D-dimers are more useful to rule out pulmonary embolism, okay? So you would just give them the treatment, which, is be, which would be a low molecular weight heparin and proceed to CT pulmonary angiogram, CTPA. Test x-ray as earlier to rule out evidence of infection. Always consider a CT scan of the head because you need to rule out any evidence of stroke or any kind of intracranial bleeding, okay? Which can cause a syncope or can be as a result of a fall with a head injury. It can be a cause or an effect. So you can you need to think about this, especially in patients with any kind of neurological issues like weakness, any slurred speech, any uh, drop in GCS, anything like that. Always think about G, uh, CT head, okay? It is, of course, unlikely that you will get this kind of patient in your PACES exam because they need to be well to be in your exam. So it is unlikely they will have something acute like this, but you still need to think about it and consider this in your question and answer with your uh, examiners, all right? And echocardiogram, in especially the elderly, to rule out critical valve disease, specifically aortic stenosis, because that can present with syncopal episodes, okay? And that would be an indication for um, aortic valve replacement if they are fit enough. Lastly, but definitely not the least, is now syncope is a very generalized presentation, so you may think about just admitting and observing them with all these investigations to be done. Okay, these can based on what you find in your history and exam, whether or not you are thinking something acute versus chronic, how. Um, how quick you need the investigations and management will depend on the presentation itself. So you may just think about admitting and observing for 24 hours, okay? So let's go back to the uh, scenario that we started off with earlier on in the uh, presentation. 
This is the scenario. You have a young woman, 33-year-old, with present uh, palpitations. So bring out those papers and look at what we have learned. So the differentials should look something like this. SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, which is AF or flutter, thyrotoxicity, and anxiety. Okay, and these are, of course, um, all the common things that you can get. There are many other possibilities, but these are the common things. Okay, in terms of the management, I'm just going to cover the most salient points. You, you should have a more comprehensive list. So here are the most salient, the most important points that should be in your list. And these are the adverse features, the ECG and the 24-hour tape or the 7-day tape to, to reach the diagnosis. Okay, and also also the thyroid status which is key to a palpitations presentation so I hope that you learned a few things from this guys these are all the very vital the very key things that you need to be looking out for and performing in your MRCP paces to achieve those marks and gain that success in your cardiovascular presentations if you want to learn more, do check out my book, which is now live on Amazon. The link will be in the description below. And of course, my course, which is available for you to check out with a free webinar. Also, the link will be down below. I hope you learned loads. I will see you in the next video.